Hi, and welcome to the Future of Dermatology podcast. I'm Dr. Farah Kamengar, board-certified dermatologist, and we are here to talk about anything and everything dermatology-related. You'll hear from me and my guests who are physicians, dermatologists, experts, scientists, and residents in the field of dermatology. We publish weekly, so if you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button and show us some love. Hi, welcome back. This is Farah Kamengar, board certified dermatologist. Today we're continuing our longevity series talking about alcohol and its effects on the skin. Um, alcohol is talked about a lot with other organs and other health effects and as a contributor to chronic disease, but it there's a lot of things that happens to your skin from alcohol, and it's not always the focus of conversation. Um, the other way to look at it is a lot of times you might go to your primary care physician and you're asked about your alcohol consumption, but it's not a question you might be asked um, by your dermatologist, which really begs to differ that we probably should because alcohol can have a lot of different effects. Um, it can cause to things like rosacea. It can lead to psoriasis, eczema, it can decrease the immune system, possibly increasing your risk of skin cancers. Of course, aging, we don't want any aging to happen. It can do that. And there are some studies that show that there might be some correlation with even um, female adult acne and uh, hormonal disturbances that might happen with the use of alcohol. So today we want to take some time and talk about alcohol. Um, the first thing I would like to kind of start with is the understanding of how much alcohol we are drinking. It's going to be used as a broad category, but not all drinks are equal. So white wine is not the same as red wine, it's not the same as hard liquor, um, not the same as light beer, uh, regular beer. So lots of different alcohol contents that could be in your drink. Then also, how much should you be drinking? So the national guidelines are don't have more than one drink a day. That's going to be a good recommendation to stay healthy. But what does one drink mean? Um, if you look at the CDC dietary guidelines, guidelines for alcohol, I promise you, you are going to find that one drink is the definition of one drink is a lot less than what you would think it would be. Um, so if you look it up, like if you look up a glass of wine, it's a tiny amount of wine in there. That is one drink. The kind of generous pour that we all do for our friends, or if you're at a restaurant, that's probably like four or five drinks. So if you look it up, it's what we can, what we think is one drink is how much can you fit in one cup, but that's not the um, exact definition of it. And then the percent proof of alcohol in whatever you're consuming is probably the most important part. And then you can do a back calculation to get to that one drink. The other important thing is that one drink a day means one drink a day. So it doesn't mean if you have three to four drinks today, but then don't drink for four days, that's not the equivalent. So it's not an average. If you drink three or four days, uh, or few, three or four drinks in one sitting, you are damaging your body. That's above the limited, you know, the limit that is allowed. Um, so it's not an average. If you also repeatedly do this, where every week you are having like one day where you just drink a ton, what's called binge drinking, that's detrimental to your body. You might be thinking, well, I'm taking four to five days off, but on the day where you do drink, you're going way above your limit and causing damage. So important to just know what the recommendations are. Probably zero is what we should be doing, but if you're going to have a drink, it's important to kind of know what the recommendation is. These recommendations are set on guidelines and research. So research shows that anything above this is going to hurt your body and damage it in a real way and lead to chronic disease and uh, decrease longevity and health. So it's important to follow these guidelines. So what about alcohol in skin? So we talked about different conditions. Of course, we have lots of studies to show that if you drink, it can lead to increased, um, of course, levels of lots of things on your skin. The most classic one we learn about in medical school is really the kind of late advanced drinker. So if someone has been drinking a lot for a long time to the point where they damage their liver, you can see signs of liver disease. So yellow skin, jaundice, yellow eyes, blood vessels on the chest red palms. Those are like the obvious signs. That's what you learn in medical school. But what about the drinker who is drinking a little bit more than they should be? They're not, you know, necessarily overusing or abusing it in the, in the in that kind of term, but they are hurting their body. What about those kind of midway signs? So let's talk about something like 
rosacea, for example. And don't get me wrong, doesn't mean if you see someone with rosacea, that means they're definitely drinking. These are not associations. We're talking about just specific risk factors. So there's lots of people with rosacea that actually don't drink ever. So that's not a trigger for them. So if you ask the question, that person says, I don't drink, then we move on. It doesn't you know, necessarily mean that in any of these um, things that I'm discussing, if you see it on the street, you just go, oh, that person, it's because of alcohol. There are multifactorial, many environmental triggers for all of our skin disease. Alcohol is just one trigger, which is what we're discussing today. But for rosacea, if you think about um, the pathophysiology, one really um, crazy thing to think about is that basically you're having a dysfunction or impairment in the brain with alcohol, and that's leading to peripheral vasodilation of the vessels um, that cause rosacea. So rosacea is that redness that you can get on the nose, the cheeks, that vasodilation or the vessels basically getting a little bit larger so you can see more redness. That is that background erythematotelangiectatic type of rosacea. You can also form papules or acne, acne rosacea, where sometimes the skin can get a little bit thicker, like what we call rhinophyma, where the nose can actually get a little bit thicker or other parts of the cheek can do that as well. So it's crazy to think about those effects when it's due to alcohol, it's alcohol impairing the brain to the point where the brain is having peripheral, the most peripheral parts you can think of from the brain all the way to the skin, it's having um, impairments. So you can just think about all the other damage that it's done to your body on its way to the cutaneous skin. So I, I bring up rosacea because I think that's kind of a crazy concept to think about that neural element of it, of like the nerve damage that's called caused by alcohol to the point where you actually have um, nerves can't function as well peripherally on your skin to keep your vessels as you know, tightly dilated as are, are constricted, I should say, as they should be. Um, other conditions, there's data for discoid eczema or numular eczema. There is uh, research for showing psoriasis is increased in, in alcohol, um, with alcohol consumption. And another interesting thing with psoriasis is if you haven't asked your psoriasis patients early on about their alcohol content, but you find your treating and treatment is difficult, the treatment recalcitrant, the normal treatments aren't working, sometimes excessive alcohol intake can be a factor. So very important if someone's treatment is just not working to double check and make sure that um, they're not hurting their body with increased amounts of consumption. Female adult acne is an interesting one too. If you see females with this really difficult to treat acne, very important to ask about alcohol consumption. They might say, I have one drink every once in a while, but again, what is that one drink? Is it a giant glass of wine? Because that's then three or four drinks by definition, a binge drinker. If you're doing that once a week, that could absolutely disrupt your skin and endocrine system and um, all the other things that kind of go with it. Uh, then there are the kind of classic things that people think about on the skin too. Let's say like the Asian glow, for example, that is a um, not necessarily in Asian populations. It can happen in any ethnicity. Of course, the South um, East Asian populations are most well associated with the enzyme deficiency that leads to that. So there are these other very kind of um, known in the culture things that you can see with, with uh, alcohol intake as well. But then there are lots of things that we see in our offices that can be associated that should not be missed. So inflammatory skin disease being at the top of them, uh, decreased immune system leading to skin cancers at the top of them as well. We know that alcohol can actually get into your bone marrow, can affect your T cells, can affect your immune system. So anything that can happen with altered immune system, alcohol can cause. And of course, lastly, aging. We can't leave it without talking about aging since this is our aging and longevity series. Um, alcohol, we talked Previously, in other um, talks about extrinsic factors that lead to loss of collagen, defects in your fibroblast cells that are supposed to make the collagen, and a clear extrinsic factor is alcohol intake. So if you really want to avoid an advanced aging, advanced um, findings of aging, easy you know, wrinkling, all of that, then probably decrease the alcohol intake as well. And that's it about the quick overview of alcohol and skin. If any of these shorter topics are of interest to you, leave us a comment. We are happy to have other episodes where we can expand on any of these topics um, and discuss them in much more detail. Thanks again. 
Thank you for listening to the Future of Dermatology podcast. Remember to hit that subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends. The more you share and subscribe, the more we'll be able to grow and share our dermatology knowledge. If you have burning dermatology questions, feel free to leave them in the comment below and we would love to address them in a future episode. And please note that this podcast is not intended to substitute for medical advice from your doctor.